see you all here. If you want to stand with us, we're going to jump into worship this morning. I just want to give a quick welcome to everyone tuning in online. I'm so thankful you're with us virtually and just pray that you'd experience God even in your home this morning.
declare that this morning. That you are worthy, you are good. You're our goodness. You're our strength and our comfort. You are our living God. Let's sing this together. How great the chasm that lay between us.
are reminded of his goodness this morning with this gorgeous weather that we're having. And, and um, we just want to welcome all of you this morning on a to start a week that we're thinking of Thanksgiving and being grateful and really dwelling on what we're thankful for. I mean, what a beautiful day he has set up for us to start to reflect on that. And we are thankful for you all who are here this morning, and we are thankful for those of you who are at home who are joining us. We are grateful. And um, just in reflecting on that this morning, I was thinking about the fact that I was going through Psalms, and 150 times it mentions the words loving kindness in reflection to him. Loving kindness. I am so thankful that we serve a God who is that abundant in loving kindness. And that's what we hope you will feel this morning at the river. For those of you who are new and maybe have never tried us, we hope that you'll encounter an expression of his loving kindness this morning. Do we have anybody new is what we would like to ask. And anybody who is brave and bold who wants to either let us know you're there or the person who brought you, do we have anybody that would like to just... Um, give us a hand raise. Yes, back there. Yes, they're new. Thank you. We welcome you for being here. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, anybody else? For um, those of you who uh, might be shy or those of you who are new and um, those of you even at home, Get, um, put your uh, phone on this. I know a lot of us have become very acquainted with this ability in technology um, and don't even have to lean on our teenagers. Um, just to reflect this, and you can go right to it and, and put in your prayer request. Let us know you're there. We would love to be able to connect with you, especially in this, this season of life where a lot of people are definitely struggling with needing the really needing to be connected with and we don't want to miss that opportunity with you so we thank you this morning for being here and um, uh, I want to introduce someone who has a great story this morning I there's nothing like a great and inspiring story and so we have Manny um, Garcia who is here this morning to give us a great and inspiring Good morning, River Church. Uh, my wife and I are new here, uh, so I just wanted to say uh, thank you. You guys have been very, uh, very uh, good in welcoming us here and making us feel at home. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm what you call a cradle Catholic. I grew up in the, uh, I grew up in the Catholic Church. Uh, my family attended uh, Mass regularly. Uh, I made my first communion at seven. And uh, it was in that same year, excuse me, I take my mask off, in that, in that, uh, I forget that I'm wearing it sometimes, I've gotten used to it, unfortunately. Uh, so in, the, in that same year, uh, when I was seven, uh, my family got a divorce, my, my parents divorced. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was really, really difficult, uh, made just a huge impact uh, on our family. We stopped going to church together. And uh, my dad had pretty much all but disappeared. Uh, I think in the 20 years to follow, I, I think I saw him only twice and just briefly. Uh, luckily for me, though, I had a uh, childhood friend who, uh, although his mom didn't go to church herself, but she, she, she sure made sure that he went. Uh, so, you know, luckily for that, I kind of uh, uh, would walk together with him uh, to church every every. Uh, every week and uh so that that was that was really that was really a blessing uh and we actually did that for years uh until until i was ready to go off to high school really um and so when i got to high school though uh 
you know, pretty typical story. I was, uh, I was working pretty much full time while attending school. So I, between work and study and sports and all those kind of things, I just, uh, I just didn't seem to have time or for church or God. And, and I was so busy getting wrapped up in the world and being in it and all that, that uh, I had just kind of fallen away uh, somehow. Even after all those years of going to church, uh, I still had kind of become that seed uh, that had fallen on uh, rocky ground. So fast forward to I'm 24, 25 years old. Uh, I was married, had a son. Uh, but after 10 fairly rocky years, uh, we divorced. So here was a uh, weekend dad, just kind of alone with my thoughts a lot. Uh, I had to kind of try and figure out what happened, what, what went wrong. Uh, well, fortunate for me, I was uh, introduced to, uh, to my current wife, Anna, and uh, I was just immediately amazed by her. Uh, she had something that I just didn't have. She had a, uh, a close personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and uh, everybody could see it. Um, so for me, uh, it didn't take me too long after that to figure out what I needed to do. I needed, uh, uh, I needed to be born anew in Jesus Christ, and uh, I needed to marry her. So luckily that worked out for me. <laughs> so uh, my wife and I have now been together for about 16 years, and we have two amazing children together. And uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, I took what amounted to uh, a pretty huge leap of faith. Uh, I sold a company that I had for 29 years, and uh, I now run a, uh, a nonprofit uh, a ministry called Reignite Hope. Reignite Hope is a, a vocational training program. We teach uh, metal fabrication to um, former gang members, um, people re-entering society after a recent incarceration, uh, people that are currently or formerly homeless, uh, or just anybody that uh, just needs a little, uh, just a little help getting back on their feet. Uh, the program was started in 2011 uh, on Skid Row, downtown LA. And today we have locations in Gardena and Philadelphia. Uh, we have two locations in Brazil and the Philippines. And we are currently building uh, locations in um, Dallas, Texas and uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Over the years, uh, we've graduated hundreds of men and women through the program. And it's just been really, really amazing uh, to be a part of it and to see what God has done through this amazing ministry that he's put together. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about that and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Manny. Wow, we can't underestimate the power of hope and uh, thank you. What a, what a beautiful ministry and boy, are we not learning about how essential hope is in the world we live in today. And I just want to introduce our pastor who will be following that with the message. And I want to tell you, Todd, I'm so happy you got my Dijon mustard memo. Yeah. So um, thank you. Thank you, Todd. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Thanks, Manny. Amazing story. You know, uh, I said at the beach, I said, we're going to change the motto of our church to just walk to church. Just walk to church. I mean, that's all it takes. I mean, amazing how God directed your life, gave you purpose, because all you did was walk to church. All you did was walk to church. Kept you out of trouble. Kept you moving forward. And then Anna, it's just, what a great story how God entered your life and changed your life 
and the course of your life. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, how the gospel shapes our life. The gospel is not simply something that we believe. The gospel is something we live. And there's a big difference, isn't there? In just believing something and truly living something. It's the gospel-shaped life. The gospel-shaped life is the life shaped by the gospel message. And Manny describes how the, how Christ entered his life and changed his life. And that's what we're looking at this morning. So we're going to look into 2 Corinthians chapter 6 as Paul describes what this life looks like in chapter 6. We've been in a series called uh, Strength and Weakness. When you are weak, then you are strong. You think, if I could just overcome my weaknesses, I'll be strong. When Christ says, you don't overcome them, I overcome them. I make up the difference in your life. We're all weak. Every one of us is weak in some area in our life. We are incomplete. We are imperfect. And Christ fills the gap. He completes the equation. That's why when we're weak, we're strong in Christ. And every week we've been looking at a new aspect. And this new aspect of it is you don't live the self-directed, self-empowered life. You live the gospel-shaped life. And when you live the gospel-shaped life, you lean on Christ, and Christ makes the difference. So that's what we're going to look at. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul begins with this. And working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. Don't throw away the value and the power and the potential of the gospel. That's what he's saying. How? We're going to talk about this morning. But I'm going to begin with a, with a, a story. This is a story about a dear friend of ours that we met when our daughter was at college and became roommates with this gal. And we met the parents, and the parents started coming to our Easter services. And, and then we go down to the desert to visit them. They have a retreat center down there, and, and then they live in Colorado. And when they're down the desert, they hike a lot because Dana is a hiker. She's been hiking the Pacific Crest Trail for several decades now. It's over 2,600 miles long. And she's one of those hikers that's called a sectional hiker. So she's hiking it in sections, and she wants to complete the entire Pacific Crest Trail. Well, they go down the desert and they hike. So we go down and, and hike with them. And she says, you know, when we see our first rattlesnake, it's over. We're done. We pack up. We close down the retreat center. They call their house in Palm Desert the retreat center. And we move back to Colorado. And I said, why? Why is it? You're a hiker. You've been hiking your whole life. You're an outdoors woman. Um, what is it about a rattlesnake that pushes you away from the trail? And she says, I'll tell you, when I was nine years old, my dad had property up in Antelope Valley up near Tachapi, and we were driving up there to go uh, hike on the, on the property. And we took a young boy with us. My dad had befriended this family, and this young boy was a high schooler. She was nine, and uh, he had cerebral palsy. And uh, so uh, they took him along with them, and Dana wanted to go hiking on, on the property, and the dad wouldn't let her go alone, so she, he, she took Jim with him. They got off the trail, make a very, very long story, very short. They got into some sagebrush, and she didn't know that the rattlesnakes were there. Before she knew it, she was bitten twice by two rattlesnakes at nine years of age. Jim sat her down in a rock, stayed calm, told her that he was going to go get help to keep her feet lower than her heart, tied two tourniquets around her legs, and ran for help. Had to run down to a trail and run all the way back to get her dad, who brought the Ford Galaxy, loaded her in it, took her all the way to the hospital. She was in shock by then. The venom was going to her heart and would have killed her if it were not for Jim's quick decisions. Saved, his, saved her life. Got to the hospital. They put her in a vat of ice. 
waited for the vaccines to arrive, the, anti-va- the anti-venoms to arrive. And Dana survived, one of the youngest children to ever survive a snake bite. Her size and her weight, she would have died if it were not for the fast action of Jim. Saved her life. And to this day, she now celebrates 50 years of that moment when she died. And here's the point. If she hadn't gotten the antivenom, she would have died. So I have a question for you, but I need my page first. Here's the question. And here's the question you have to ask yourself. What do you do when only one thing can save your life? What do you do when only one thing can save your life? That's what Paul is saying. Do not receive the grace of God in vain. Don't throw away the anti-venom of your life. And if you throw it away, it will be in vain. Your life depends on it. And that's what the Corinthians were doing. They were squandering the life that God had given them. A gospel-shaped life is shaped by the grace of God in your life in two ways. It's worldview. Everybody's got a worldview. And worldviews, as we know it, are lenses in which we see the world. We make our decisions. We evaluate things. We, we live out our lives based upon our worldview. Everyone's got a worldview. Some have God in it. Some people don't. Some people have chosen to eliminate God from their worldview. And whatever your worldview is, that's what shapes your life. And what I am suggesting, what Paul is suggesting in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, is the gospel should be your worldview, the way you see everything. And you need two things. Number one, you need to receive the gospel. Number two, you need to live the gospel. That's it. Two things. And Paul begins with this in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 6. So once he establishes the fact that we are not to live out the grace of God in vain, he says this. The acceptable time I listened to you, on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of salvation. Paul begins the gospel-shaped life with this idea You must receive it. Now is the day. But first we have to understand, before we understand the now, we have to understand what it is that we're supposed to receive, right? I mean, what is the gospel? I mean, in in a nutshell, how do you describe the gospel? The gospel is salvation as Paul describes it. But what does that mean? What does it really mean? We talk about salvation. The world talks about salvation. We need salvation. You can find salvation in a lot of things. Salvation is an answer to a problem. But how does the New Testament describe salvation? Well, I'll give you one verse. John 3.16, one of the most noteworthy New Testament verses in all the New Testament. Wouldn't you say? John 3.16. You've actually seen John 3.16, probably a sign held up in a football stadium, right? You always thought it was John Madden's weight, and it's not. It's actually John chapter 3, verse 16, and it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Kind of sounds like Dana, doesn't it? In the desert, perishing because of a venomous snake bite. And yet she got the antivenom that saved her life. Now, what's interesting about this verse is most of us don't read the two verses before it. And if you read the first two, the two, the two verses before John 3, 16, here's what it says. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man will be lifted up so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Now, what is John referring to? 
Where does this come from? This comes from Numbers chapter 21. This is in the Old Testament. Israel, 400 years living in Egypt, in bondage, are finally released. And as they head into the wilderness, headed for the promised land, they're in the wilderness. They're in the desert. And they don't like being in the desert. They want to get to the promised land. And the Old Testament is a story about waiting, waiting for God to show up and direct us and lead us. And it's more about the process than it is about the destination, isn't it? Isn't that true? God is more concerned about the process of us learning to trust him. And so he left the people in the desert to learn how to trust him. Because if they couldn't learn how to trust him, then they wouldn't be able to be trusted with the promised land. And that's true of your life and my life as well. And so here they are grumbling. They want to go back to Egypt. God says, God decides, enough's enough. They need to learn how to trust me. So he sends fiery serpents. Now, they're already there in the desert, but he must have gathered a lot of them together, and they began biting the people of Israel. A fiery serpent, they're, they're, they're adder, probably adders. There's various snakes that they could be, but it's probably an adder. And when an adder bites you, it's so venomous that uh, when the venom goes in, it, 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 it burns within you. You're burning up. Your, your temperature rises, and you're literally overheating, and then your vital organs stop functioning, and you die. I mean, it's, it's death. It's a death sentence to be bit by one of these serpents. And they burn up, literally. That's why they're called fiery serpents. And so these fiery serpents are now biting the people of Israel, and they all realize why it's happened. They've disobeyed God, and they go to Moses, we've sinned, we have disobeyed God, we haven't listened to him, and we haven't listened to you. Forgive us. And God tells Moses, what I want you to do is I want you to make a bronze serpent, and I want you to lift it up on a pole. And all the people have to do is wherever they are, just look up to the serpent and they will live. All you have to do is look up. Just look up to this serpent and you will be healed and the venom that's in your life, that's in your body right now, that's killing you will be gone. You'll be healed. And you're asking the question, why a serpent? If the serpent is the thing that bit them, that's causing their death, then why is it the thing that's on the pole that will save them? How does the serpent of death become the serpent of life? John tells us, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so Christ will be lifted up for you. What Jesus did is that he held out his arms And he allowed the serpent to bite him. In taking the venom of the venomous snake, he formed the antibody, the anti-venom within him that that was then transferred to anybody that desired to be healed. That's exactly the gospel. That's what John says, why God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. Jesus ingested the snake that kills to become the snake that heals. That's who Jesus is. You and I have been impacted by the venom of the world. Every single person that's listening to me, every person that is here, has been injected by the venom of life. The sin of the world has gone through our veins. And we are burning up spiritually just as the Israelites were burning up physically. Through discontentment, disharmony, we are broken up and we need a healing. We need an anti-venom. And when Jesus offered himself up, he becomes the serpent that heals. Look to the serpent that heals because he's taken the sin that is upon the world upon himself so that it's no longer impacting us. He ate it up. He took the venom 
and created the antivenom for you and I. That's the gospel. And that's what Paul is talking about. Now is the day of salvation. Today is the day to receive the antivenom from life. It's available to every single one of us. The problem is that we, like the very first human beings in Genesis chapter 3, were given the promised land and it wasn't good enough. The sin of the world is the sin of discontentment. Living in paradise with God was not enough for Adam and Eve. They turned to the serpent and got bit. And Jesus had to come to give them the antibod, the antivenom, to heal them of their discontentment. And you and I experience that, and we're searching for answers. We're searching for life. We're searching for something else, and it's right here. Now, today, is the day of salvation. It's Christ, the serpent on a pole, lifted up, and all you and I have to do is look. We don't have to crawl out of our seats. We don't have to climb up the pole. All we have to do is look. It's been done. The gospel is news. The gospel literally means good news. News is something that's already happened. Jesus already went to the cross. First Peter chapter 1 says he bore our sins on our behalf on the cross so that when we believe in him, we have eternal life. That's the gospel. That's salvation, and it's available. And I, for some reason, cannot figure out why people don't understand why today's the day. Today, now. See, what Manny described is a story of today's the day. The time is now. And it's not a chronos time. It's not an age-based time. It's an experience-based time. It's kairos. Twice, Paul says, kairos, time, the time, the experience. This is a kairos moment. You ever had a kairos moment? Like, aha. It's an aha moment. Like, oh, my gosh, I never realized that. I finally put things together. And maybe for the very first time in your life, you're putting it together going, what am I doing? Why am I resisting? We are procrastinators, aren't we? I'll do it later. I'll do it after the kids are raised. I'll do it after I get my job all figured out. I'll do it when, I, when the kids move out and we retire. I'll do it later in my life. I'm living my life now the way I want to live my life. Great. That's fantastic. Have a great time. But you're living with, with a venom that's killing you. And what's being offered is an anti-venom. And I, for some reason, can't figure out why people would not go, I want that. That's what I want. There it is. It's available to us. It's the Kairos moment right now. Don't put it off. That's what, And you know what? about procrastination, every time you resist, your heart grows a little harder. The more you resist, the more resistant you become. Resist him today, you'll probably resist him tomorrow. In fact, one of my mentors in life, John Bruce, said this, moral choices develop a momentum of their own. Don't they? You just fall into a a decision-making process in your life, and that's the momentum it follows, and you wonder, why? what's going on? I have this great friend. We played water polo together here in the L.A. County region. We played different high schools. No idea. Probably guarded each other and didn't know it until we got to college and became college roommates in a fraternity. Mike and I have stayed in probably the best touch of any of my fraternity brothers over 40 years. We've been through a lot with him. A lot of hardships, a lot of difficulties. Even in college, a lot of breakdowns, and I've just sat there with him. We're totally different. have totally different ideologies in life, and yet we truly respected and loved one another. And we formed a great friendship. And I was there, and I used to tell him, and to this day, he keeps reminding me. Every time he calls me, he goes, Todd, I'll never forget your words in college. You said, in the midst of one of my greatest breakdowns, I was just falling apart. I was literally coming apart. 
And you sat me down and said, sometimes God brings things into our lives to make us stronger. And I never forgot that, Todd. Um, I dedicated his first son to the Lord. He asked for a, a, de- a word of dedication right there in his crib in his home in Northern California. He and his wife went through a divorce. Um, he's had several girlfriends. Called me several months ago. His girlfriend, the one that he has now that he's just le- madly in love with, um, broke up with him. The kids didn't, her kids didn't like him. And for whatever reason, it didn't work out. And so he called me and I said, oh, Mike, I'm so sorry. And he goes, on top of that, I just lost my job again. So I'm headed up by Lake Shaver. I'm going to go hike on a hike. I'm just going to go alone and go hiking. But something weird happened. He called me. On his drive, he looked down and there was a, there was a truck on the side of the freeway. And on the side of the truck, it said this, his blood for my sins. And he called me and he asked me, what does that mean? 40 years I've known him, and he finally asked the question. It was a Kairos moment in his life. Maybe you're having one right now. Maybe right now it's making sense, like it's never made sense before, and you've been resisting the idea that there is a creator out there that wants to know you. He does not want to harm you. He wants to know you and love you, and it's not going to mess up your life. It's going to make your life better. And maybe you're ready. But there's a second thing to a gospel-shaped life. First, you got to receive it. And maybe you've been resisting him. Maybe you're, you've received him, but you're still resisting him. Be careful. Resistance develops hardness. But there's a second thing, and this is it. you got to live the gospel. And Paul goes on. And so he goes on, he says, but in everything commending ourselves as servants of God, we did not want to do anything that would give cause of offense. And, and, and in, the, in, the, in the original language, the, 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 the mood is subjunction, subjunctive. It's an eris passive subjunctive. And in the subjunctive, it's in order that. It's in a hint of phrase, so it's so that the possibility would not happen. The possibility that my, that my life would be an offense to you, that you wouldn't accept what I believe. So what Paul is saying is, it's the subjunctive is about my purpose. It expresses purpose. In other words, Paul's purpose statement for his life, according to this verse, is that he would live his life so consistent with what he believes that he wouldn't cause an offense to anybody. He would want his life to match what he believes. That was his purpose. I want to live my life so consistently with my belief system that I would not cause offense. And here's the message, translation. People are watching us as we stay at our post alertly and unswervingly. It's a great translation. People are watching as you stay your post. How do you stay your post? Two things. To live out the gospel-shaped life. Hardship and partnership. You will endure endure hardship, and you must decide who is your ultimate partnership with. That's what Paul says. See, he begins, he he goes, as servants of God, in much endurance. Do you see that? He goes on, afflictions, hardships, distresses, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labors, sleeplessness, hunger, impurity, and knowledge. And and he talks about all these hardships, all the difficulties that he endured that made him live consistently with his message. And if it were not for those hardships, he would not have been able to learn how to live consistently what he actually believes. He understood the purpose of difficulties in his life, and he lists them out. But then he also lists out other things. He lists out in kindness and Holy Spirit and genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, 
by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor. What's he doing? He's now moving from hardships to the fruit of the Spirit qualities. In other words, Paul learned how to live a consistent life in the good and in the bad. And you may be going through a really bad season right now, and, 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 and Paul's telling you, hang in there. You may be living a really good season, and the fruit of the Spirit is just flowing from your life. Great. You're living consistent with your message. And whether it's a good day or a bad day, and you're going to have both, believe me. We all have good days, and we all have bad, bad days. Your relationship with God is not based upon your circumstances whether it's a good day or a bad day. It's based upon your conviction and belief that you want to live a life so on purpose that you can say, I don't want to cause offense to anyone. Why? Because we understand that we can only impress people from a distance through our abilities and skills. But we impress people up close by our character. It's developed through the hardships and difficulties and the acceptance of the good and the bad that's in your life. What are you enduring right now that is shaping your life? Let me tell you a story. My junior high best friend, we did everything together. Everything. Family, friends, water ski trips. We studied together. and Just, we were best of friends right through high school, went off, he got married, went through a divorce, went up to Seattle, got remarried, reconnected down in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. We've discovered that his folks had bought a house down there, and we would go down after Christmas every, uh, every year and, and spend, a, spend a week together. Denise and I would spend a week down there retreating, relaxing, and praying, and reading, and just re, kind of refueling our tanks in our marriage. So we ran into Alan and his wife and, and then stayed in touch. And uh, Alan called me and said, um, my wife wants to get a divorce. But she said, I'm going to give it a try. Why don't you come to church with me? Let's see if that solves it. Meets the pastor, loved the pastor, ends up giving his life to Christ. I can't tell you how many God conversations we had had over the 40 years. Gave his life to Christ. His wife leaves him gets cancer, and in Cabo San Lucas, both of his parents are killed in a taxi drive. The Christian life is not easy. As C.S. Lewis says, if you're looking for an easy religion, don't choose Christianity. It's the wrong one. If you are looking for a silver bullet, you're looking the wrong place. It's not easy. It is not an easy life. It's because you're a Christian does not mean all your problems will go away but it will make you stronger. There's a second quality, and I'm going to end with this. Partnership. See, Paul now moves from hardship to discuss another issue. He says, do not be bound with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light and darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has a temple of God with idols? Do you see the contrast? He's talking about a contrast in two philosophies, two ideologies, two value systems. Righteousness and lawlessness. Light and darkness, harmony and Belial. Belial is another term for a false god in the Old Testament. What, do you have, what, what does the believer have in common with the person that has no belief? I mean, see what he's doing? And what he says is don't be bound together with that philosophy. In other words, he's not talking about um, going into business. He's not talking about marriage in this context. Some people think this is a marriage passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he does talk about finding a mate with, with the same value system and the same convictions that you have. That's, that was part of your story, Manny, and how you met your wife, and you saw something in her and wanted what she had, and now your lives are changed because of that. And so that is true, 
But what we're finding here is that he's talking about something else. He's talking about being bound. This idea of being bound, what does it mean? It means alliance. No unholy alliance. It's not about living the perfect life. It's about living a purpose life aligned with everything that holds your convictions. That's how you live the gospel-shaped life. It's living it with full alliance in Christ, the things of Christ, not the things of this world. And so that's what he's showing us. Um, It's, let me talk just a little bit about that because in John chapter, James chapter four, he talks about this idea of friendship with the world is hostility with God. And, and in James, he describes it, he says, you are adulterers is basically what James says. You're an adulterer because you've, you've given your heart away to the world when God wants your heart. See, it's a conversion of the heart that leads to a gospel-shaped life. Does that make sense? So something has to happen in the transaction. In fact, the word itself means alliance. It's only used one other place that we can find. Plutarch uses it, and he uses the idea to be bound together as alliance or ally, an ally. You form an alliance. Who are you forming alliances with? Where are you forming alliances with in your life? Because I think people try to live the Christian life a lot of different ways. And some people try to be a moral Christian. And some people live out their morality because of fear. They're afraid that if they don't live a moral life, something bad will happen. So if I live a moral life, then nothing bad will happen to me. Some people live a moral life out of pride. I can do it. I'm better than they. I'm better than you. Watch me. I can do it. I can live the best moral life. Watch me give away money. Let sh- I'll show you what I can do because it's all about me. But the third kind of person is the gospel-shaped life person that has had a conversion of heart that Jonathan Edwards describes with these words. It's when you have been smitten by the beauty of God who is truth. You are overwhelmed by the beauty of God and you are smitten by God. Oh my gosh. God is so grand. God is so beautiful. He is so powerful that I am overwhelmed by him and a conversion of the heart happens and you are so drawn to his truth that it is you are living no longer for your own sake but for his sake. You are making your decisions not based upon your own personal pleasures and desires, but for God's sake. I'm part of a church not because of me, but because of what I am part of. I'm part of the work of God, the community of God, and I have a a, a part to play in this. Do you see the difference? The gospel-shaped life begins to change the way in which you perceive things and make decisions because you have formed your ultimate allegiance to the beauty of God that has smitten you and you are overwhelmed. Are you there yet? See, what Paul goes on to say is, I will dwell with them and I will walk, there. I will walk with them. This is fellowship. This is not demanding, a th- demanding morality. This is not the command This is the invitation of relationship, of joining with God, and I will be their God and they will be my people. The the intimacy, do you notice that? Come out from the midst and be separate. Why? Don't touch what is unclean because I am your father and you are my children, my sons and daughters. The intimacy of that family relationship has taken you in, and it's no longer an abundance an obligation, but the desire of your heart. That's the gospel-shaped life. That's where it begins. So let's pray. I want you to take a minute. 
And before the worship, just take a minute and um, reflect. Lord, where am I? Where am I right now? Do I have the venom and is it just creating a discontentment that I just cannot get rid of? It's burning me up. And Jesus is saying, come to me, all who are and living. Come to me. Look up to me. And you can do that right now. Just look up to Jesus and say, Jesus, I accept you. You bore my sins on the cross so that I might have eternal life. I receive that. I am sick. I am dying. And I want to be healed. You will in me. And maybe you're here this morning and you just need to reflect on the endurance, the hardship that you're experiencing right now in some area of your life. And you just need to have a new perspective or maybe an alliance that you have formed in some area of your life where you just want to cut that out. It's done. It's over. Give it to the Lord as we worship the Lord this morning.
just want to invite you, if you're able, to stand as we finish the service and declaration of Jesus as our cornerstone, as the rock on which we stand. this morning that through it all you are our strength you are our rock and you are our cornerstone Lord we just allow that truth to just sit in our hearts right now before we say goodbye we allow that truth to really sink into our hearts that Jesus you came that we would live out this gospel life that we would know you that we would be known by you so Lord as we go throughout our weeks may that truth serenade our hearts may it sing us into communion with you jesus so we pray this in jesus name amen amen well thank you guys for coming out thank you to the online we'll give olivia the sweet amazing friend and worship leader what a powerful set we love you guys we'll see you online this week or next sunday have a good day